The president. Question. Questions. Question number one, Dr. Junis Ho. Thank you, Mr. President. Some members of the public have pointed out that in the 2019-2020 financial year, as at the end of December 2019, there were 978 cases of suspected fraud relating to Comprehensive Social Security Assistance, or CSSA, reported by members of the public, but there were only as few as 51 convicted cases. They query that the law enforcement by the Social Welfare Department has been perfunctory and thus failing to have a deterrent effect on CSSA fraudsters and abusers. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the respective number of cases of suspected CSSA fraud reported by members of the public and detected through investigations initiated by the Social Welfare Department in each of the past five years, Two, of the details of SWD's current manpower dedicated to the prevention and investigation of fraud and abuse relating to CSSA, and three, whether SWD has taken the initiative to investigate if CSSA recipients own properties or other assets in places outside Hong Kong, and if they own significant amounts of cash assets without making declaration, in order to avoid the means test and obtain CSSA by fraud, if SWD has, whether it has reviewed the effectiveness of the current measures and introduced new measures to step up its efforts in combating CSSA fraud, if the SWD has not of the reasons for that. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. Mr. President, the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance CSSA scheme provides a safety net of last resort for those who cannot support themselves financially due to old age, ill health, disability, single parenthood, unemployment at low earnings or other reasons, and aims to help them meet their basic needs. The scheme is means-tested to ensure that finite public resources are targeted towards catering for needy persons. Means tests under the CSSA scheme are conducted on a household basis in upholding the concept of promoting mutual support among family members. To ensure proper use of public monies, the Social Welfare Department, SWD, has been sparing no effort in combating CSSA fraud all along. In handling CSSA applications, SWD staff will ask applicants and their family members to submit detailed proofs of their assets in and outside Hong Kong, such as bank statements, time deposit receipts, insurance policy statements, documentary proofs of stocks, land and property ownership, etc. Applicants and their family members also need to submit income proofs, such as mandatory provident fund pay records, pay slips, employment contracts, documentary proofs of dividend and rental income, etc. In addition, for the purpose of verifying the various information provided by applicants and their family members, SWD staff will interview all applicants as well as pay home visits and make inquiries to the relevant employers, previous employers and landlords where necessary. SWD conducts regular reviews and spot checks on approved cases to verify whether recipients remain eligible for CSSA through various means. SWD also conducts data matching with other government departments and relevant organizations periodically and on a need basis to verify the validity of information provided by recipients. These departments and organizations include the Immigration Department, Land Registry, Companies Registry, Treasury, Working Family and Student Financial Assistance Agency, Hospital Authority and the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation Annuity Limited, etc. The scope of the data matching includes recipients' travel records, hospitalization, conditions whether they're in receipt of other government subsidies, income, records of land and property ownership, etc. Where SWD receives reports or suspects during regular interviews um, or regular reviews and spot checks that CSSA applicants or recipients have not honestly declared cash or other assets or have even placed assets outside Hong Kong to circumvent the means test, SWD will conduct proactive in-depth investigation and verification of the cases. Serious cases will be referred to the police for follow-up. If necessary, SWD will also take the initiative to reach out and to verify with government departments or organizations such as banks of the places where assets are allegedly hidden. All information provided by the applicants' recipients must be true, correct, and complete. 
anyone who knowingly or willfully provides false statements or withholds any information in order to obtain CSSA by deception commits an offence. Apart from being disqualified for CSSA, he or she may be liable to prosecution under the theft ordinance. In addition, applicants or recipients must report to SWD as soon as possible any changes in information previously provided which may affect their eligibility or cause a reduction in the amount of CSSA payable. Applicants or recipients who do not report such changes on purpose may be liable for, to prosecution for breaching the theft ordinance. With respect to all suspected fraud cases substantiated upon the department's in-depth investigation, SWD will recover overpayment from the relevant applicants or recipients. Generally speaking, the SWD will issue written warnings to those concerned or refer serious fraud cases to the police for investigation. Persons convicted of fraud by the court may be imprisoned, bound over, sentenced to community service order and fined. CSSA fraud is not common as a matter of fact. In 2021-22, the number of suspected CSSA fraud cases reported by members of the public and detected through investigations initiated by the department was 1,143 and 550 respectively. Only 323 suspected fraud cases were substantiated upon the in-depth investigation, which accounts for less than 0.2% of the total number of cases of about 220,000. The number of suspected fraud cases reported by members of the public and detected through investigations of by SWD, suspected fraud cases substantiated upon investigation and follow-up actions in the past five years are set up in the annex. At present, there are six special investigation teams within the Social Welfare Department for investigating suspected fraud cases reported by members of the public or referred by hotline SWD staff and for recovering overpayment. These teams mainly comprise 120 Social Security grade officers and currently employ six retired discipline services officers as investigation advisors to assist in handling, handling more complex cases so as to enhance the effectiveness of counteracting CSSA fraud. In, order, in addition, to remind the recipients to report their circumstances honestly and drawing attention to the serious consequences of defrauding payments through its departmental website. SWD publicizes the same message by publicity materials placed at all social security field units to raise law-abiding awareness. Members of the public may report to suspected fraud cases in person at the social security field units or may do so through SWD's report fraud hotline, online form, email, fax, or by post. SWD will continue to adopt a stringent approach in handling each application, implement initiatives in different areas, and endeavor to prevent and counteract CSSA fraud with a view to ensuring proper use of public monies. Dr. Junis Ho. Mr. President, now I raise a question. I ask whether the SWD's law enforcement action has been perfunctory, but it seems that uh, the Secretary is only playing with the numbers. According to his reply, the fraud cases account for only 0.2% of the 220,000 CSSA cases, be it the 1,143 or 550 as a denominator. That should be a, um, a case detection rate of 28 or 50, 58%. You should not use 220,000 as your uh, denominator, Secretary, isn't it perfunctory? Indeed, we have 220,000 uh, CSSA cases and some 290,000 applicants are involved. 80% of these recipients are uh, the old and frail and chronically ill. And we have a stringent mechanism of approving applications. And only a small number of cases involved fraud of CSSA payments. And when we consider the small number of fraud cases, we also need to have regard to the total number of cases to determine the proportion of fraud in the mechanism. And over the years, the number has proven to be small. Mr. Dom, um, Dominic Lee, according to our service and the district for many years and our observation, there are indeed many suspected cases of CSSA fraud. Like Dr. Junis Ho said, it could be as high as 30% of all cases. My question is, 
if the, you do not have report received from members of the public, do you have a mechanism to initiate investigations yourself? And how long does it take for the investigation process to complete? There are a number of hurdles to go through in applying for a CSSA. The first hurdle is the application stage. That means the applicant would need to attend interviews in person to submit uh, documents and information. And only when the officer is satisfied will the CSSA be granted. And the second hurdle is a review. Last year, the SWD reviewed 150,000 uh, cases uh, out of the 210,000 cases in total. We take a risk-based approach. In other words, for some cases, uh, you may have a review once every three years. And for able-bodied adults, however, the frequency is higher. We conduct mostly annual reviews. So we have the vetting procedure, we have the review procedure to stem out fraud. We also have spot checks. And we also rely on reports made by members of the public to ensure proper use of public money. Mr. Stephen Ho. As mentioned by Dr. Ho and Mr. Lee, as we have observed, well, have you um, put the mic on your lapel? Right, thank you, Mr. President. As mentioned by the two members, as far as our work in the community is concerned, we could feel that there are many uh, suspected CSSA fraud cases. We have a definition of fraud. We believe these are not genuinely needy persons. They do have assets. But then, according to the government's uh, definition of fraud, they need to comply with the government's uh, eligibility criteria. That means they need to fill in forms for checking. My question is, has the department reviewed the mechanism to see whether the criteria could stem out fraud, such as bogus marriages in the past, and also those having assets in the mainland and haven't made a declaration to the department? Have you initiated cooperation with other government departments in your investigation process? And are these government departments willing to provide information? Because if they are not cooperative, these fraudsters would continue to practice fraud. That is at least fraud in our definition. To answer Mr. Ho's question, we have a very clear uh, means test mechanism. Let me give you this example. Say if we have received a report from a member of the public or in the review process, suspicion is raised on possible CSSA fraud. Apart from having an interview with the applicant, we also pay home visit. Say for a single parent CSSA recipient, during the home visit, well, if we find um, uh, items used mostly by men, and we would be suspicious and we would uh, take the initiative to conduct investigation. And say for assets in the mainland, if we have the suspicion, we would write to the relevant uh, authorities in the mainland for information to be provided, and we do receive replies from them. Uh, we do not keep st statistics, but last year we issued 300 such letters to the mainland authorities to check if the recipient uh, owns any real property on the mainland. So we do have a mechanism to prevent CSSA fraud. You talked about, well, I, I'm talking about other governments, not just um, the uh, authorities in the mainland. We work with any government. Let's say if somebody owns property overseas, we also write to the overseas counterpart to seek verification from the authorities concerned. Mr. Peter Show. Mr. President, the CSSA is a safety net to help those genuinely in need. We are deeply dissatisfied with the CSSA fraud. Now, Secretary, in recent years, we have encountered a prevailing difficulty in the recruitment, especially in our sector. Now, if we pay wages by cash, many applicants would come forward. They would prefer cash payments because they could circumvent the investigation 
uh, relating to the CSSA payment. They do not have additional income because of uh, the CSSA payment or because of their status as PRH tenants. Now, are there ways to stop them? Secretary. Mr. President, as I said, during the application stage, the applicant is required to declare all incomes and earnings. They are required even to declare uh, sums of cash by transfer into their account. And under the new arrangement, uh, the disregarded earnings would be $4,000 for one month. So the most important point is for applicants to declare uh, their income and assets to us. Mr. Peter Shiu, your question hasn't been answered. Mr. President, my question is actually um, whether the government has ways to stop uh, those receiving wages uh, by cash and hence circumventing the CSSA investigation. I have nothing to add. Mr. Yao wing -Kit. Mr. President, I've received inquiries and calls for assistance from uh, elderly CSSA recipients. Their family members have actually taken out uh, uh, um, insurance policies uh, with emphasis on savings uh, without the knowledge uh, of the elderly recipients. And the insurance policies are above the uh, permitted income asset limit. And uh, these elderly people are really in great fear of being sent to prison. Uh, I've received many calls for assistance in this regard. Are there ways to help them? If the CSSA recipient is also an insurance policy holder, he is required to make a declaration. In our publicity effort and also in our interviews with the applicants, we ask with great clarity whether they hold any insurance policies and elderly recipients are required to do the same. Elderly applicants may not be as articulate, but we will uh, try different ways to make sure they uh, do the declaration if necessary. Mr. Lai Tong Kuo. About the six special investigation teams of the Social Welfare Department, I'd like to ask their um, whether they're efficient. According to a reply, they investigated 1,600 cases as of last year. So they have you have six teams comprising 120 great offices. Uh, that means per year, they investigate uh, one case only, um, then so 13.3 cases per year per team, and then only some 300 cases were substantiated. Following that, the cases will be referred to the police for follow-up investigation. You don't provide the prosecution figures. You have 120 officers to conduct investigation. Why can't you initiate prosecution afterwards straight away? Why must you refer these cases to the police for follow-up investigation? Isn't it a duplication? Yes, there are 120 social security grade officers in our six special investigation teams. Apart from cases uh, reported by members of the public or those referred by the front uh, frontline staff, there is still um, a lot the teams are required to do because overall speaking, we have over 120,000 beneficiaries under the CSSA system. So that's the first point. Second, if we're satisfied that there is basis to initiate prosecution, as our next step, it is appropriate to approach the police because police has uh, ample experience in this regard. Mr. Lee, um, Stanley Lee, according to the government, there are different ways to ensure proper use of public monies. Now, let us consider from another perspective the penalties for uh, such offences. My question is uh, whether the penalties are deterrent enough for those substantiated cases. Once the court decides on the CSSA fraud cases, the um, penalties are meted out by courts. There are case serious cases involving imprisonment as well as community service orders. Second question, Mr. Chou Chow. 
President, the government's current dental pol care policy aims to raise through publicity and education, public awareness of oral hygiene and health, and to encourage the public to develop good oral hygiene habits. Under the current policy, the government mainly undertakes publicity and so on. So can the administration tell us uh, over the past five years how many people have received uh, treatment or consultation at those uh, government clinics? And also secondly, are there any uh, medium to long-term policies to come up with a policy for dental care? If yes, uh, please give us the details. And also, are there any plans to uh, train up more uh, dentists? And if none, uh, why? And thirdly, through the um, number of um, clinics um, uh, or DHCs, uh, will there be any plans? And also, through the um, through the um, primary health care um, uh, steering committees, will there be further plans? And also, uh, if there are any details, please tell us. And if none, uh, why not? Secretary for Health and Hygiene. At present, uh, the government's uh, policy is to uh, enhance public awareness on oral health uh, by way of education and publicity. And the public would also have to have uh, a good policy. Uh, and the gov under the current policy, the government mainly undertakes publicity, education, and promotion of oral health, particularly with emphasis on nurturing good oral hygiene habits from an early age, including providing the school dental care service to children. Generally speaking, the need for dental treatment or surgery due to tooth decay and gum diseases can be greatly reduced if good oral hygiene habits are maintained. The government currently provides or subsidizes limited dental services, which mainly include providing treatment for the public or for emergency cases and implementing measures for persons with special dental care needs especially the elderly and families with financial difficulties or persons who have difficulty in assessing general dental services. These services include special oral care services and healthy teeth collaboration for persons with intellectual disabilities, as well as dental care support for the elderly under the Outreach Dental Care Program for the Elderly and the Community Care Fund Elderly Dental Assistance Program Elderly persons may also use health care vouchers to receive dental services in the private sector, while persons with financial difficulties may also receive subsidy to cover dental treatment expenses under the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance Scheme. My reply to the various parts of the question raised by Mr. Holden Chow is as follows. First, at present, General dental care services in Hong Kong are mainly provided by the private sector and non-government organizations. The limited dental services provided by the government are confined to emergency treatment. The Department of Health, or DH, allocates certain sessions each week in its 11 dental clinics to provide free emergency dental treatment, commonly known as general public sessions, for the public. Such services cover treatment of acute dental diseases, prescription for pain relief, treatment of oral abscess, and teeth extraction. The dentist will also provide professional advice with regard to the individual needs of patients. The number of attendees at the 11 DH clinics or dental clinics was GP sessions over the past five years, and the relevant establishment of dental offices are set out in the annex. Second, to cope with the rising demand for dental services in Hong Kong, the government has further increased the number of University Grants Committee or UGC-funded first-year, first-degree training places in dentistry in the 2022-23 uh, to 2024-25 to triennium in, uh, from 80 to 90. It is expected that there will be around 400 dental graduates uh, becoming registered dentists in the coming five years. The government will also provide 10 UGC-funded taught postgraduate places in dentistry per year in the 2022-23 to 2024-25 triennium to ensure a stable supply of dental specialists. On the admission of non-locally trained dentists, the Dental Council of Hong Kong has increased uh, since 2015 the frequency of the licensing examination for non-locally trained dentists from one sitting to two sittings per year. 
and has improved the arrangement of certain parts of the licensing examination and updated its result retention policy so as to attract more qualified non-locally trained dentists to practice in Hong Kong and contribute to the diversity of the local dentistry workforce. Separately, as set out in the 2022 policy address, we will explore creating new pathways for the admission of qualified non-locally trained dentists. We will press ahead with the formulation of specific details of the proposal and consult relevant stakeholders afterwards. Subject to the progress of discussion, we will strive to introduce the legislative proposal into the Legislative Council within 2023. Third, District health centres, or DHCs, serve as the hub for coordinating the provision of primary healthcare services for the public and collaborating with various healthcare professions. Services of DHCs focus on primary, secondary and tertiary prevention, which include health promotion, health risk factors assessment, disease screening, chronic disease management and community rehabilitation, etc. Under the steer of the Steering Committee on Primary Healthcare Development, DHCs are currently directing resources to tackle the most prevalent health risk factors and chronic diseases that consume the most uh, substantial medical resources, including hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal disorder. DHCs also organize health promotion activities such as health education on dental and oral care and play the role of a primary health care resource hub in the district connecting different healthcare professions in a community including dentists coordinating and making referrals for persons in need. The government is well aware of the public's keen demand for dental services and the 2022 policy address has therefore put, up, put forward the setting up of a working group on the development of dental care services to review the existing dental care services and advise the government on matters including enhancement of the scope and mode of these services. The government will continue to maintain communication with various stakeholders, including the Legislative Council, and listen to their views with a view to formulating measures to promote the oral health of the public. Thank you, President. Mr. Holden Chow. Well, um, Secretary, in the main reply, you said that you'd be uh, relaxing the um, rules uh, for non-locally trained dentists to practice in Hong Kong. Of course, I did see that, uh, but then there's still room for improvement. And I understand that, uh, well, I would often go to Twin Moon in the small hours of the morning in order to visit uh, those who are waiting for the dental uh, uh, clinic to open in the morning. Well, that's good. But then um, for the Twin Moon um, general uh, general uh, services, uh, it would only be available one day a, a week. And then... um. I think uh, the uh, maximum would be three places and then the minimum would be just one. So can you just increase the number of uh, places so that so as to help those who have been aid waiting earnestly for the services? So can that be done at least? Uh, yes, we do understand um, the need of the public. And if you look at the establishment of um, the government, we have uh, 371 and we have uh, up to 50 vacancies and therefore there are uh, many vacancies and therefore in retention of our talents we have been adopting a multi-pronged approach in doing that for the existing dental clinics for the main functions supposedly are uh, to serve um, um, the uh, civil servants that's uh, because uh, that's one of the um, terms uh, under the uh, employment policy for uh, civil servants because we do have the duty to provide our dental services uh, to um, serving civil servants and their families. And therefore, uh, these dental clinics have been set up for the purposes of um, undertaking those uh, obligations under the employment contract. And then, um, in terms of the sessions that have been uh, set aside for the public, uh, the utilization rate is already up to 100%, and therefore there is no um, possibility that we can set aside further sessions to increase the uh, free emergency dental treatment services or general public sessions for the public. Next, um, Mr. D uh, Bill Tang, I think the shortage of manpower is already affecting many sectors, including dental services, uh, including both uh, services in the public and private sectors. And well, for the lic licensing examination that has been halted, and also we, we are also narrowing the scope of services, and you're actually only increasing the number of uh, places by 10, and there'll be even more uh, fierce competition between the public and, and private sectors for dentists. And you said that uh, there are a large number of uh, 
there is a large number of vacancies uh, in the dentist establishment in the government. So how come there is such a severe shortage? That's because there is a lack of promotion uh, pathways because uh, you've already scrapped the system under which there will be consultant dentists. So will you consider increasing the uh, promotion pathways um, in the government establishment in order to attract more talents to join the government as a government dentist. Thank you. Secretary, well, as far as the government is concerned, in terms of the dentist uh, establishment, there is indeed a promotion letter. As to the detailed establishment, I think the Civil Service Bureau has already got um, a very clear um, guideline and uh, there are a set of rules to go by. And also on the ratio of uh, individual uh, grades and so on. Well, uh, I understand that uh, uh, government's uh, pay is rather attractive, but then the government has also put in place a private uh, public partnership in terms of uh, dental services so that for elders in need, they can make use of health vouchers and so on. And there are also alternative ways for them to go to the private market in order to get the services. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Bill Tang. Thank you, President. We understand that uh, healthcare professionals are in great shortage. As the Secretary said, uh, one, one in seven is now not filled uh, in terms of the uh, vacancies. And um, obviously, uh, there is a shortage of um, services. And if that is the bottleneck, then can you implement this proposal? That is um, from the Greater Bay Area. You can also introduce this health uh, voucher or dentist, dental services voucher because many elders uh, are reluctant to go to um, a private dentist in Hong Kong because uh, the cost would be at least uh, $700, but then they would be more than willing to go to Shenzhen for such services because it's a lot cheaper. So can you uh, allow them to receive uh, private dental services um, in the Greater Bay Area by using the health care voucher? That would help them. So can you consider that? Secretary, well, for the healthcare vouchers can be used uh, at the Shenzhen Hospital of the Hong Kong U, and the um, Shenzhen Hospital uh, run by Hong Kong U does provide uh, dental services. But then, because of the pandemic, it would be quite difficult for members of the public to travel to Shenzhen to get those services, including whether or not they're going to use the healthcare vouchers. So we will have to first deal with the pandemic situation before we can allow people to travel across the boundary to get the services. But then indeed, uh, for Hong Kong people uh, living in Guangdong pro province, uh, they can still receive uh, dental services from the Hong Kong U Shenzhen Hospital. Mr. Ngan Men Yu. Thank you, uh, President. Many elders uh, lack the awareness of uh, oral hygiene, and as a result, uh, their two teeth are uh, in ill condition and therefore they will have to go to see the dentist and very often they would have to undergo surgery. And um, yes, uh, the Community Care Fund has already um, enhanced uh, um, its subsidy for these elders. But then for elders uh, with uh, acute uh, dental problems, uh, can you subsidize them when they get dental services? I suggest that uh, there can be a progressive uh, system whereby those who are elder, who are older can get more subsidies. So can you consider that? Secretary, well, in order to assist those in financial difficulties uh, to get dental services, in fact, uh, the, the CCS uh, system would uh, actually provide subsidies these are for people to get dental services. For those eligible CSSA recipients, they can apply and go to the 73 uh, subsidized dental clinics to receive um, um, the uh, consultation and also get the services. And registered dentists in Hong Kong can also provide the treatment that is needed. And the level of subsidy would depend on the actual charge of the clinic and also recognized um, uh, charge uh, of clinics and also the maximum level set by the uh, SWD, so uh, the higher would prevail. And we will also uh, set up um, a working group uh, on dental services to look into that, and that will be further discussed uh, by the working group. Next, uh, Ms. Um, Chen Hoi Yen. Well, in the main reply, 
Um, the secretary said that uh, there would be limited uh, dental services uh, in emergency situations. But then, if you look at the eleven dental service dental clinics, uh, there is only uh, there are only two Kowloon, uh, Kowloon uh, City and also Kun Tong uh, Dental Clinic. So uh, the uh, Kowloon City uh, Clinic is open on Wednesday, and then uh, Kun Tong uh, is open on another weekday. So that would be av available for the entire for all the residents in Kowloon. So that is uh, far from adequate uh, because uh, you can't provide emergency services. So if they have uh, two uh, teeth uh, or three teeth uh, that are in pain, they, then they will have to wait for at least uh, two or three times before they can get the uh, treatment. So given the fact that uh, there is such a secure, such an acute shortage of uh, this uh, for the general public, so can you uh, do a bit more to help those um, in need? Secretary, we have to emphasize that uh, for dental uh, health policy. We have to do it by way of uh, publicity education in order to enhance our uh, public awareness uh, so that we can encourage the public to have a uh, good oral hygiene habits. So that's a preventive approach. With regard to the limited dental services that we are, re we are providing, they are only confined to emergency situations. As I said, the original purpose of setting up these dental clinics was to provide uh, services for the civil servants and therefore it's very limited. And also, given the manpower of dentists, uh, we have a vacancy rate of over 12%. And therefore, for the time being, there is simply no possibility that we can increase the number of sessions. And indeed, uh, for dental services, they are mainly run by the private sector as well as the NGOs. They are non-government agencies or organizations. With regard to the detail, um, plan for further development of dental services run by the government. As I said, uh, there's um, a working group on the development of dental care services in Hong Kong. It will be reviewing the situation and uh, it will be making recommendations for the long term. Yes, Elizabeth Court, uh, very often in the district we can see that elders couldn't sleep, couldn't eat because of uh, uh, tooth pain, and uh, this is really very heartbreaking. That's why we have been telling the government you will have to enhance uh, training so that more dentists uh, can be trained up to provide the services. And you said that you'd be introducing more non-locally trained uh, dentists. That would be welcome. I hope that that can be done by way of uh, uh, legislative amendments. And I hope that the working group on the development of dental care services would not only would not take uh, five, seven years uh, to complete this work because uh, there is this urgent need for more services. And you are not able to provide the services right now because of the limitation. Then uh, can it be done by way of a public-private partnership so that services can be provided uh, to those in great need, for example, grassroots elders? And just now, we also said that for such a PPP, uh, can that also cover uh, dental services uh, available in the Greater Bay Area, other than the uh, Hong Kong Yu Shenzhen Hospital, so that for those in genuine need, they can improve their oral health, uh, because we don't have any policy on that yet. So you will have to consider that, Secretary. Secretary, well, for the existing mechanisms, including healthcare vouchers and also subsidy, subsidy plans and so on, they are already um, able to allow the elders to go to a private dentist uh, to get the services. As to further uh, PPPs, as proposed by the Honourable Member, for example, to procure private dentist um, services and so on, we will have to wait until after the Working Group on the Development of Dental Care Services uh, has come to a conclusion after consulting the stakeholders. With regard to um, healthcare vouchers, uh, Indeed, because of the pandemic, not all the elders would be able to go to the Hong Kong Yu Shenzhen Hospital to use the healthcare vouchers there for dental services. We do have plans so that uh, healthcare vouchers' um, scope of use can be extended. In particular, healthcare vouchers can be used uh, to uh, take out um, mainland's um, healthcare policy, and uh, we would also be uh, looking into the possibility of. Uh, Healthcare agencies meeting the requirements so that they can also be allowed to accept uh, healthcare vouchers, but then that would be somewhat more complicated because we will have to consider their uh, quality of services, etc. But then uh, that would also be subject to the limitation uh, uh, of the pandemic. Next, uh, Michael Tian. Well, on the 13th of May at the Health Services Panel meeting, I pointed out that, um, well, in this day and age, uh, eyes. Uh, 
uh, ears and also mouth. If we have problems, we can always go to a government clinic for consultation. But then for dental services, they are not available. And therefore, I propose that we should introduce a non-locally uh, dentist to provide the services and so on. You promised that you would be looking into that. And uh, a few months later, the policy address said that uh, you would be uh, exploring the possibility of introducing non-locally trained dentists into Hong Kong. And does that mean that in the long run, you're going to give the green light uh, so that uh, for government services, government health care services, that would also cover dental services? I'd like to know the details. And if there, are, there is a sufficient supply of dentists, well, will you be covering everything, including mouth, uh, ear, and eyes, and also teeth? Uh, or would, that, would it be that uh, you would only be covering some of the services, but not all. Secretary, well, you're talking about um, uh, having public hospitals providing comprehensive uh, health care services for the public. Well, in the working group on the development of dental care services, we will be looking into that. But then indeed, right now, public health care services can only provide emergency services, and uh, that might not be able to cover all these services. Question number three, the Honorable Yong Hai. Yan. On the 31st of August this year, the Vice Premier of the State Council clearly expressed the hope that Hong Kong strengthens its professional services, provides professional services such as legal, maritime, financial, and consultancy services for the Belt and Road Initiative, and builds in BRR an our comprehensive services platform. Regarding the professional financial services to be provided by the platform, will the government inform this council, one, whether it has drawn up plans on the professional services to be provided by the platform, if so, of the details, including the implementation timetable, the anticipated outcome, for example, the number of investors to be attracted to invest in BR and our projects, and how Hong Kong can consolidate its status as an international financial center through provision of such services. Two, how the Infrastructure Financing Facilitation Office under the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and its partners, including the Silk Road Fund, will dovetail with the building of the comprehensive platform so that the platform can provide distinguished professional financial services for the BNR initiative. And three, whether the government has put in place other complementary policies and measures to attract and facilitate overseas financial institution investors to, through the professional uh, financial services to be provided by the platform, participate in the financing of BRN infrastructure projects, and if so, of the details, if not the results for that. The Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury. President, I would like to thank uh, the Ms. Yong for her question. My consolidated reply to the three parts of the question is as follows. President C stated in his important speech delivered on the 1st of July this year that the central government fully supports Hong Kong in its effort to seize the historic opportunities offered by national development and actively dovetail itself with the 14th five-year plan and other national strategies such as the development of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area and the high-quality development of the Belt and Road. Indeed, the, a, as our government attaches great importance to the opportunities, brought by the BNIR and will continue to make a good use of Hong Kong's mature and efficient financial market and professional strengths to contribute to the Belt and Road development in the following financial service aspects. First, in infrastructure financing facilitation, the HKMA set up the Infrastructure Financing Facilitation Office, IFFO, in 2016 to connect key stakeholders for, for promoting infrastructure investment and financing. IFF O now has nearly 100 partner institutions from the mainland, Hong Kong, and the overseas. Since its launch, the IFFO has organized more than 30 large-scale conferences, seminars, and workshops on infrastructure investment and financing to share relevant information experiences and best practices. Since the establishment of the Infrastructure Financing and Securitization Department in 2019, the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation, HKMAs, MCS, invested in infrastructure loan assets of over 800 million US dollars as the end of last year, covering projects in the BNR countries. HKMC is taking forward a pilot infrastructure loan backed securitization scheme expected to issue up to 450 million US dollars of PILBS products in the institutional market within this financial year. And the objective is to channel market capital into high quality infrastructure projects for promoting regional economic development and consolidating Hong Kong's position as the regional infrastructure financing center. 
to offshore renminbi business. The mainland's economic and trade connectivity with the Belt and Road countries keeps strengthening and is increasing the use of renminbi in bilateral trade and investment. As of August this year, renminbi deposits, including outstanding certificates of deposit, in Hong Kong was about uh, 990 billion renminbi, providing liquidity support to offshore renminbi transactions and financial services in the BNR countries and regions and globally. Statistics of the worldwide interbank financial telecommunications SWIFT also indicate that about 75% of global offshore remedy uh, payments are processed in Hong Kong. We will continue to take forward the relevant work and enhance market infrastructure to enhance our strengths as the largest offshore remedy business center. Three, asset management and corporate treasury center. We are endeavoring to attract corporations in the Belt and Road countries and regions to set up corporate treasury centers in Hong Kong. In this regard, we have launched a series of measures, including the limited partnership fund regime and the fund redemocialization mechanism and tax concessions for carried interest issued by eligible private equity funds. We will also offer tax concessions for family-owned investment holding vehicles managed by single-family offices in Hong Kong. HKMA will also continue to actively promote the strengths of Hong Kong as a CTC hub to corporations. Four, green and sustainable finance. To encourage more entities to make use of Hong Kong's capital markets and our financial and professional services for green and sustainable investment, financing and certification, we launched in May last year the Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme to provide grants for eligible bond issuers and loan borrowers to cover their expenses on bond issuance and external review services, encouraging more green financing activities in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited launched a voluntary carbon trading platform last week on which eligible participants can trade voluntary carbon credits to neutralize or compensate for the buyer's carbon emissions. Corporations in the Belt and Road countries and regions can make use of this platform to trade high-quality voluntary carbon credits and facilitate capital flow to green projects. Five, risk management. There are many multinational um, insurers and reinsurers with rich experience and knowledge in Hong Kong, which can provide diversified professional services for enterprises participating in the Belt and Road related infrastructure investment projects. We encourage mainland entities interested in making foray into the international market to establish captive interest in Hong Kong to elevate their consolidated corporate risk management capabilities. Through setting up the Belt and Road Inf Insurance Exchange Facilitation Platform of the Hong Kong Special Risk Consortium, the insurance authority has put together stakeholders, including enterprises, insurance companies, insurance intermediaries, industry associations, experts, to promote information exchange and facilitate matching of special risk owners with surface provider, promoting the sustainable development of the Hong Kong insurance industry. Four, six, Hong Kong accounting services. Hong Kong's accounting sector is renowned for its high professional level with good high professional standards and regulatory regime at, or at international levels. The new regulatory regime of the accounting profession in Hong Kong has been in operation since 1st of October this year, which has vested the regulatory powers of Hong Kong's accounting sector with the Accounting and Financing Reporting Council. A regulator independent from the profession, bringing the regime in line with international developments. The accounting profession can provide high quality accounting, auditing, and assurance services for enterprises and projects in the Belt and Road countries and regions, helping these enterprises and projects align with international financial standards. We will continue to make good use of Hong Kong's strengths in financial and professional services and further Hong Kong's participation in the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you, President. The Hong Kong Observatory has announced that. The number eight uh, typhoon signal will be hoisted before 145 p.m. I will adjourn the meeting after I have dealt with the two um, government's motions. Well, Ms. Eunice Yo, the government has done a lot in relation to the B and RI. I think the uh, measures are quite fermented now. And um, the IFFO under the HKMA, the secretary says that it has uh, 100 partner institutions. But we don't know the effectiveness of this IFFO's work. And we expect the government to do more. 
especially the central authorities have ordered that we should build a comprehensive platform. What is our uh, uh, roadmap here, Secretary? Thank you, President. For this uh, comprehensive uh, services platform in relation to BNR, this is a very broad subject. We are working on many fronts, including risk management, accounting, sustainable finance, and also uh, infrastructure financing. So we are doing work on all these fronts. Ms. Eunice Young is very clear about this. The IFFO under the HKMA uh, specializes in this uh, kind of work. A lot of the projects are long term, and the risk and the returns involved uh, may not be within the capability scope of the uh, financial institutions. So many uh, countries, including Hong Kong and other parts of the world, are doing more in um, infrastructure financing. Because um, the projects are long term and the risks are in, involved are high, these may be challenging. So there are specialized institutions working on these fronts, even though this is the case. And um, that doesn't mean that we are working on a fermented uh, approach. When we look at the uh, build and road initiative, there are uh, demands on all sides. Uh, there are demands on infrastructure financing, demands on professional services like uh, accounting. Outside of my main reply, say if there are conflicts between party A and Party B, mediation services are also required. So when we talk about the comprehensive services platform, it should cover a wide scope. And Hong Kong is an international financial sector, and we provide a range, a wide range of professional services. So we are presented with tremendous opportunities. Different institutions are working on different fronts, but it's not the case that we are not. Uh, we are working on our own silos. Um, our CEDB colleagues are, are, are also here, so he can also talk about the BNR summits and seminars that he has hosted and the work that the, the CEDB has done. So can I defer to Mr. Chen, please? Thank you. First of all, we will continue to work with the relevant ministries of the mainland and through various exchange platforms. We will closely liaise with them, like what the secretary said. And we have hosted a number of matching sessions. For example, we have hosted a number of exchange sessions and also uh, sessions in relation to economic trade and overseas cooperation zones overseas. Over the years, uh, we have uh, seen the participation of over 4,000 representatives uh, from different organizations. The annual uh, BNR summit is also very popular, and there is one on one matching session. And the one this year was held in August, and we have hosted over 800 such matching sessions. So through these matching sessions and our uh, routine work, we would identify opportunities in the BNR uh, region for uh, Hong Kong enterprises. Mr. Champin Lang, uh, the secretary said the uh, IFFO has hosted a number of seminars and provides a plat uh, various platforms to promote investment uh, opportunities. But people have reflected to me that um, by purely providing a platform, that doesn't suffice. They look forward to the government to more actively uh, identify opportunities in investment and help them resolve their problems. Does the government have any plans to uh, step up the functions of this platform? Thank you, President. Secretary. Thank you, President. Well, the, um, well we've been heading towards the direction of um, promoting coordination among the different government departments. The IFFO will identify opportunities for financing. I say, but then on a more macro level, we would aim to identify more opportunities for Hong Kong companies, and we um, 
aim to provide Hong Kong's financial and professional services to uh, be enrolled countries. Um, the effort, our effort has been ongoing. I visited the Philippines and Bangkok and international um, uh, occasions like APAC and ADB meetings. Uh, I have met with different representatives from in, uh, from international community. And the Indonesia has a plan to uh, relocate their capital, and huge capital is involved in this exercise. I have recommended to them our financial services. So if we receive any information on specific projects, we we'll definitely um, talk and liaise with our colleagues in the HKMA, and they will follow up on um, seeking the relevant opportunities. Members can rest assured that um, different government departments and organizations are communicating with each other so that we can, as a whole, serve the be it belt and row countries. Mr. Tempo Lang. The uh, insurance authority has established a Belt and Road Insurance Exchange Facilitation Platform and the Hong Kong Specialty Risks Consortium. It has put together different stakeholders, but then it doesn't have the capability to uh, take on certain risks and their effectiveness uh, is yet to, to be improved. Does the government have any measure to make sure that these platforms can really help and bring insurance uh, business from the Belt and Road countries to Hong Kong and promote the sustainable development of Hong Kong's insurance industry? Mr. Chan has pointed out that under uh, the insurance authority, we have set up these platforms. We would like to meet the industry's demand say in Belt and Road countries, if there are insurance opportunities, we'll try to uh, provide the relevant services. In my main reply, uh, we said that at these platforms, uh, there are different parties' participation, including enterprises, insurance companies, insurance intermediary, intermediary and industry associations. The risks are on all sides, so we need experts to help us, specialists to help us, so that we know exactly how we can provide um, solutions to problems in the uh, insurance sector. If you, if Mr. Chen has any specific suggestions on how we can improve the platforms, we are all ears to members' views. We will follow up after the meeting. All along, we've been liaising with the mainland um, institutions, like in our visits. I have um, communicated with ministry leaders um, in various um, Belt and Road countries. We have tried to. Uh, talk to the state-owned assets Supervi supervision and administration commission of the state council on this. We would like to highlight our strengths uh, in our professional services and financial services. We would like to help state-owned enterprises to go out and um, invest in projects and belt and road. Uh, countries, we have been liaising with the insurance authority all along. We would definitely follow up on any opportunities identified. Mr. Kenneth Falk. Well, Hong Kong should uh, give full place to its own advantages um, in one country, under one country, and two systems principle. In the Nansha plan, it is said that support will be given to Hong Kong and Macau to. Uh, assist Hong um, mainland enterprises to invest in the Belt and Road regions. Does the government have any plans to cooperate with the Guangdong uh, Provincial Authority uh, government to do more work in Belt and Road countries? Let me declare an interest. I have projects. Uh, my company has projects in Nansha. Well, we have talked to Mr. Fock earlier. This is a state policy, and we've been following closely on um, state policies' latest developments. We will try to leverage on Hong Kong's strengths to serve the country's needs. In Nansha, well, in terms of green finance, we can do some work. They hope that 
they can cooperate with us in promoting green finance to foster the development of non sha We've been following up on that front. We have um, introduced Hong Kong companies to non sha We will try to leverage our non strengths and uh, enhance the overall competitiveness in the region. Now, apart from green finance, I also said that we should help our state-owned enterprises to go out. For um, Belt and Road regions, uh, some state-owned enterprises and also private enterprises are also trying to invest them there. Um, they have some of them have been there for uh, quite a while, so they do have some understanding. So we are a professional. Uh, um, we provide professional services. So we can provide, say, mediation services, legal services, financial services. So we can provide one-stop services to them. We hosted many seminars and forums. Well, these are just beginnings. There is still some way to go. So given the opportunities, we will do our very best to give full play to the strengths of our professional and financial services to help these enterprises to establish a presence in the Belt and Road regions. Let me say this to members. If in your uh, dialogue with uh, different people, if you identify any uh, opportunities that we can follow up on, uh, we will be more than happy to listen to you. Thank you, President. For the comprehensive services platform, will the gov does the government have planned to establish a BNRI board on the Hong Kong Exchange? Now, uh, Shang the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock markets are not fully open, so the European and the U.S. Uh, companies cannot actually establish or access the market. So I think the responsibility lies on the Hong Kong stock market. If there is a dedicated BNRI board on the Hong Kong Exchange, um, then Hong Kong will uh, play a bigger part in uh, the BNIR. Mr. Tang, so a question relates to a bigger uh, subject. How can we um, help? our listed enterprises to go to the BNR regions. I have been doing work on that front. Uh, I have uh, visited, uh, paid visits uh, to overseas countries. We hope that uh, more overseas companies can be listed in Hong Kong. And in the Hong Kong Exchange, there is new initiative uh, to allow more companies to be listed in the Hong Kong, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Well, to a certain extent, we have a uh, 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 an arrangement in which BNR um, companies can be listed in Hong Kong. We are fully open. If investors would uh, are more interested in the BNR projects, uh, we do have indexes to provide reference uh, for the investors. So we would like to do more to attract international enterprises to get listed in Hong Kong. Question four, Ms. Judy Chen. Thank you, President. Information of the Environmental Protection Department shows that although commercial vehicles, commercial vehicles, um, including Trucks, buses, light buses, and taxis account for only about 20% of the total number of vehicles in Hong Kong. The nitrogen oxide emissions account for more than 90% of the total NOx emissions of all vehicles here. There are views that the use of new energy commercial vehicles can improve roadside air quality. In this connection with the government involved this council, one of the respective numbers and percentage of new energy vehicles in various types of registered commercial vehicles at present. Two, whether it has assessed the effectiveness of the various incentive measures and trial schemes relating to the promotion of the use of new energy commercial vehicles, CVs, launched in the past three years, and whether it will introduce new measures and ancillary facilities to promote the popularization of new energy CVs. If it will, of the details, if not, reasons for that. And three, 
whether the government has studied the establishment of a legal framework for the use of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. If so, of the details, if not, reasons for that. Secretary for Environment and Ecology. President, the government announced last year the Hong Kong Roadmap on Popularization of Electric Vehicles, the Clean Air Plan for Hong Kong 2035, and Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2050, setting out the long-term policy objectives and plans to promote green transport. Among them, the transition of commercial vehicles, CVs, to new energy vehicles with zero emissions is vitally important to reduce rosa air pollutant emissions and attain the target of carbon neutrality in transport sector before 2050. In terms of new energy and electric CVs technologies, the adoption of single-decker buses in overseas and the mainland is gradually increasing, while the technologies for goods vehicles are still under development. Hong Kong is a relatively small market with right-hand drive vehicles and has a unique and demanding operating environment, including a majority of buses being double-deckers, air conditioning required all through the year, hilly terrains, high daily mileage, and high passenger loading. Therefore, it takes time to identify models that are suitable for our use. With a view to accelerating the adoption of electric and new energy CVs in Hong Kong, the government has been proactively communicating and collaborating with the trade and vehicle manufacturers. In this regard, the government has set a target specifically for the transition of CVs to zero carbon vehicles, which is to, to announce a roadmap for the promotion of electric public transport and e-CVs by 2025. My reply to the question raised by Ms. Judy Chan is as follows. One, at present, new energy CVs are not common in Hong Kong. According to the Transport Department, as at the end of September 2022, there were a total of 3,848 registered new energy CVs, including hybrid vehicles, which include 358 goods vehicles, 68 buses, 33 light buses and 3,385 taxis, accounting for 0.3%, 0.5%, 0.4% and 18% of the total number of vehicles in their respective classes. 2. As regards the promotion of tri trials of um, electric public transport and ECVs, the government has injected $180 billion to subsidize franchise bus companies to purchase 36 single-decker for trial on a number of routes, with a view to assessing their operational performance and help helping these companies to build confidence and gain experience in using e-buses. Most of these single-deckers continue to operate after trial. They have helped these companies to understand the operation of e-buses and necessary support required when a large fleet is to be adopted in the future. With the experience gained, some bus companies have placed orders with manufacturers for single and double-decker. They have announced their plans to use more single and double deck e buses for for their service. As for public light buses, the government is also making preparations to launch a eighty million dollar pilot scheme on electric public light buses, which is planned to commence in twenty twenty three. Besides, the government is providing subsidies to the transport trade via the $1.1 billion New Energy Transport Fund, the fund for short, for trials and applications of green transport technologies, including various new energy CVs and vessels. Over the past five, uh, three years, the fund has approved 120 applications on ECVs and electric vessels, putting a total of 163 electric, light, medium and heavy good vehicles, e-buses, e-taxis, e-coaches and e-motorcycles, as well as three e-vessels on trial. To further promote green transport, the Chief Executive's 2022 policy address announced a wide range of measures. These include trials of at least 180 e-CVs in the coming few years and a roadmap for the promotion of public transport and e-CVs by 2025. Generally speaking, most of these uh, ECVs under trial were found to be smooth, quiet and environmentally friendly, and in general pose no problems for drivers. They also have they also help to save fuel costs. In view of this government targets to introduce about seven hundred e buses and three thousand e taxis by end of twenty 2027. We provide assistance to bus companies to replace the old diesel buses with new e-buses, as well as uh, to set up charging facilities in new and existing bus depots. For taxis, the government will continue to encourage more suppliers to introduce e-taxi models suitable for use in Hong Kong. There is also the promotion of trials of new generation e-taxis and replacement of old LPG taxis with electric ones.
In parallel, we have stepped up efforts to set up at e-taxi charging network, including the ins installation of dedicated quick charges for taxis on Lent Island and inside Kong by phases. They are expected to commence service from mid-2023 onwards. Three, there is a global drive to identify and develop zero carbon technologies in order to achieve carbon neutrality. The consensual view is that hydrogen fuel will be increasingly used in the future. It has the potential to become one of the key zero carbon energy sources. Our country is also exploring hydrogen fuel technology, including the use of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles to keep abreast with the developments uh, in order to allow more choices of uh, Hong Kong in the future. The our Bureau is leading an in interdepartmental working group to progressively commence the trials of hydrogen fuel cell, electric double-decker buses and heavy vehicles in 2023 with a view to assess their performance in a local setting. The government will also conduct risk assessments on hydrogen refilling stations, arrangements of hydrogen supply, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles on road, etc., and a review and to review relevant re regulations and standards as well as guidelines in order for the establishment of a legal framework for the local use of hydrogen fuel. President, I re agree with the Secretary that we have a very challenging operating environment. As far as I know, for those double-decker on um, trial, they are, they are used on flat terrain. And I have learned that they have put um, electric public light buses on trial, but the performance was not ideal. Our country has put in place a prime example. In the Winter Olympics this year, they have used um, hydrogen fuel buses, about 70% of the terrain's uh, hilly, and for such buses, uh, un at under 20 degrees Celsius, uh, they can provide um, they can provide heating, and the charging only took a very short time. So I wonder whether this new energy will be used and what percentage it will be, because we would like to see an early introduction of hydrogen hydrogen fuel buses in Hong Kong. Secretary, of course we will explore the use of uh, hydrogen buses and how to expedite its introduction. We have with franchise buses as well as heavy vehicle suppliers, as well as uh, suppliers of hydrogen fuel. We are having a discussion. We hope that the trial could be put in place early next year. As I've said, that hydrogen fuel plays a very important role to achieve a zero, um, zero carbon emission. But we do need to find out what technical support we need, what standards there are in place, and if it, there is popular use in Hong Kong, what is what the cost is compared to uh, e-vehicles and other forms of energy. So it's not close, just close to the heart of the company. It's also a concern for bus companies and other transport operators. So we do need to uh, put these uh, vehicles on trial to see how we can further promote it. Mr. Chen Siu Hong, I'm glad to hear that the um, EEB is has put in place a working group uh, to put in place a trial by 2030. Uh, 2023, the use of hydrogen fuel cell electric buses and vehicles. The use of this energy is maturing. There are practices that we can draw reference from, from other parts of the world. So apart from uh, setting standards, uh, revising regulations and setting guidelines, well, how can they promote the cooperation of the academic government as well as the trade to promote the use of um, hydrogen fuel? I mentioned about a trial in my reply. It's not just the work of the government. I've also mentioned that we will make use of 
a discussion with different parties and organizations, say for example, potential hydrogen fuel suppliers and users. Mainly the two franchise buses operators as well as operators of heavy duty vehicles. We'll talk about supply and use. Different departments will participate. That includes the EMSD, which will support uh, we will give technical support. Um, the fire services department that will uh, who will which will provide advice on a safety as well as the um, transport department. So, from upstream supply to downstream use, uh, we will participate. We will set up a an expert panel inviting academics and experts to to participate because I'm sure that with the experience and their knowledge, we will all benefit from it. So as I said, for upstream su supply and downstream use, together with the academic, we will start this trial. We will in detail study technology involved as well as uh, the feasibility of its use in Hong Kong in the future. Mr. Kenneth Lau, I declare that I am a user of an electric vehicle. Last year, the government announced a popularization roadmap of electric vehicles. By 2050, all um, diesel and um, uh, fuel propelled vehicles will be phased out. Currently, when we see for electric vehicles, they use lithium batteries, which is very costly and difficult to be recycled. Local universities have recently made an, a breakthrough, uh, a go-kart using a new energy, which is just, um, which is much cheaper than a lithium battery. So that we have, the, we are in the position to widely promote the use of um, this energy in order to uh, popularize uh, the use of ammonia as a fuel. Well, in the promotion of hydrogen fuel, there are many different ways. Ammonia is um, an actually a spin-off of hydrogen. We can directly heat up ammonia, but there are also saying saying that, well, hydrogen fuel should be turned into a, a, a battery, a cell, which will propel vehicles. So there are many different ways to make use of hydrogen fuel. But why is there an emergence of ammonia fuel? Because hydrogen has a very low density. It is very difficult to transport and handle this fuel which in turn push us, pushes up price. If we turn hydrogen fuel into ammonia, which has a higher density, then transportation will be easier. So there are views saying that if we use ammonia fuel, it will be better. There are research and development um, of uh, directly heating ammonia or using ammonia directly as a battery fuel, but it depends on its cost. Because if you turn fuel in, if you turn hydrogen into ammonia, then we need to consider many different factors. We will monitor the trial to see how it develops. In exploring the use of hydrogen fuel vehicles, we can put in place a small trials to use of ammonia fuel. We keep an open mind. In the end, we will see uh, the what the cost is as well as the maturity of the technology before we make a decision. Mr. Gary Chan, I do agree that the use of new energy is the future trend. Well, the government said that uh, they would put in place a lot of uh, e-buses but for e-buses, there are problems with charging as well as um, uh, the uh, distance they can travel. For the cost of one e-bus is um, 
twice of that of a diesel bus, but the lifespan is is half of a diesel um, bus. So why would anyone purchase such a costly bus? You said that a bus franchise bus operators will receive subsidy under the new energy transport fund to replace their diesel buses. But what about at the time of renewal of their franchise, you put in place a requirement that bus operators will have to use new energy vehicles? Secretary, Mr. Chen talked about a crucial point. That is in relation of cost. Under the new energy transport fund, trial of different technologies will be subsidized. However, in terms of long term use, we will have to look at different factors. Bus operators will receive support. And however, bus fares will have to be affordable. Our economy is suffering from a downturn. We need to consider financial soundness in any operation. We'll talk to bus operators to see there are if there are ways. for the government to spend wisely um, whilst helping bus operators to develop their uh, to develop the op the use of new energy vehicles we don't roll any possibilities we work with the transport and logistics bureau to explore this issue at the moment, we don't have the best solution, but we will consider all different options. Mr. Frankie Yick, President. Well, Secretary, I personally think that the development direction of heavy duty vehicles will be on hydrogen fuel cell. It's a technology that is in existence, but it will take time for it to be popularized. The challenge Hong Kong faces is the uh, provision of hydrogen fuel and whether these vehicles are allowed, are allowed to use cross harbor tunnels or other tunnels. If it still takes time to adopt this technology, at the beginning of 2024, there is uh, the supply of liquefied LPG. This technology is commonly used on the mainland, and the prices are rather affordable. Why don't you consider using this as a transitional arrangement before the introduction of uh, other technologies, that is, to allow heavy-duty vehicles to make use of liquefied um, petroleum gas, uh, liquefied natural gas? What we consider mostly is that it will not put a heavy burden on the trade. Heavy duty vehicles are expected to have a long lifespan. And if we consider the use of uh, liquefied natural gas as a fuel for heavy duty vehicles, then we need to first consider infrastructure and assistance offered to help them replace these vehicles. But um, liquefied natural gas is not a zero emission, so before 2050, these vehicles will have to be replaced by zero emission, zero carbon emission vehicles. And that would put an extra cost on the, on the trade. It is not cost effective for us uh, to divert our direction. When we plan for zero carbon emission, we need to consider the total operating cost of the trade and the um, problems of replacement of the fleet. So our current proposal is the best direction. Mr. Kennedy Wong.
In the third paragraph of the Secretary's reply, he said that in order to achieve uh, carbon neutrality, there are many different ways. I am aware that on the mainland, they make use of um, methane, green methane, to replace uh, fossil, uh, fossil fuel. And I hear from the government that there is an inter interdepartmental working group. But we're talking about expertise that are beyond uh, the knowledge of departments. Wouldn't you approach other experts, including mainland experts, to help you? We have regular exchanges with experts of different fields, including mainland ones. So we are alive to the development of different areas. Locally, we work with universities and companies that provide the technology as well. You talk about green uh, methanol. Well, this is not a new technology. The use of methanol in propelling uh, vehicles is a technology used year uh, many years in other places in other countries but this is still an interim technology to be used we're talking about carbon neutrality so we want to achieve zero carbon emission green methanol you may say that um, it is environmental friendly it is a, a carbon neutral uh, fuel but large scale use may create other problems. So we are exploring other um, zero carbon emission technologies. Well, we may use this form of um, a fuel if we are if there are outstanding problems unresolved. Question five, the Honorable Yim Kong. Thank you, President. The 2022 policy address has put forward a number of measures to draw for talents, including attracting leading innovation and technology talents around the globe. There are views pointing out that apart from INT, sectors such as finance, maritime, education, healthcare, and arts and culture also need to attract leading talents in order to foster Hong Kong's diversified development. In this connection, would the government inform this council one whether it will extend the concept of leading talents to include fields such as INT and lay down a clear definition or guidelines for this concept so as to facilitate leading talents in other fields to have a clear understanding of the government's preferences in terms of talent demand. Two, as the aforesaid policy address has pointed out that the government will provide special facilitation measures in a targeted manner to attract top-notch INT talents to bring with them their business or research and development outcomes to Hong Kong of the specific proposals for such measures and whether they are sufficiently competitive internationally. And three, whether it will consider formulating key performance indicators for its work in attracting leading talents. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. President, in consultation with the Innovation Technology and Industry Bureau, ITIB, my consolidated reply to a question raised by the Honourable Yim Kong is as follows. One, the concept of leading talents is closely linked to the development of relevant industries with varying specific criteria and requirements for leading figures under various industries. The existing talent admission schemes for Hong Kong allow talents of different backgrounds and professions to seek development in Hong Kong with a view to meeting the shortfall in local talent supply and enriching our own talent pool. While most of the admission schemes do not set restrictions on industries, different schemes provide professional in shortage locally with facilitation in different forms and to different degrees. For instance, the Quality Micro Admission Scheme, or QMAS, aims to attract highly skilled or talented persons around the world with no restriction on their industries. There are two streams under the QMAS, namely the Achievement Based Points Test, APT, and General Points Test, GPT. APD caters for top-notch talents who have received an award of exceptional achievements such as Nobel Prize, National International Awards, or Olympic medals, whose work has been acknowledged by their peers and have contributed significantly to the development of the field. Separately, applicants assessed under GPT are awarded points based on the background, including academic or professional qualifications, work experience, international vision, 
language proficiency and future plan in Hong Kong. Additional points will be given to relevant talents who meet the specifications of respective professions under the talent list, facilitating them to settle in Hong Kong. The Advisory Committee on a Mission of Quality Migrants and Professionals will recommend to the Director of Immigration how best to allocate quota after considering all relevant factors. As announced by the Chief Executive in the policy address, the annual quota of QMAS will be suspended for a period of two years and the approval process will be improved in order to attract more world-class talents to relocate to Hong Kong. Moreover, a new top talent pass scheme targeting at high-income talents or graduates from the world's top 100 universities will be launched, covering top-notch talents in various industries. Any individual meeting the requirement of annual salary reaching 2.5 million Hong Kong dollars a past year of graduation from the world's top 100 universities on four designated world university ranking lists can apply for a two-year visa to explore opportunities in Hong Kong. As the INT industry is crucial to the development of Hong Kong, the government has been formulating special measures to attract leading talents in basic scientific research to Hong Kong. Launched in June 2021, the Global STEM Professor Scheme, Professorship Scheme stepped up efforts to support universities in recruiting international renowned INT scholars and their teams to conduct research and teaching activities in Hong Kong. The scheme has so far supported over 60 outstanding scholars. Moreover, the policy address announced the intention to attract leading INT talents around the globe. The ITIB will collaborate with the Office for Attracting Strategic Enterprises, OACs, under the Financial Secretary to provide special facilitation measures in a targeted manner to attract top-notch INT talents to bring with them their business or R&D outcomes to Hong Kong. Respective policy bureaus will continue to review the developments of various pillar and major industries, including the manpower needs of these industries in order to formulate appropriate industry-based measures to recruit leading talents after thorough consultation with relevant stakeholders. Two, OACs will formulate attractive special facilitation measures covering aspects such as land, tax and financing that are applicable exclusively to target enterprises and provide one-stop facilitation services in areas such as visa application and education arrangement for their children, etc. With regard to the INT industry, leading tenants who play an influential or leading role in a certain technology area internationally are able to drive development of the relevant industries in that area. For instance, talents who hold patents of core technologies or authority figures who have been involved in developing international standards or has extensive experience in transforming, transforming R&D results. ITIB will collaborate with OACs to negotiate with the enterprises for businesses to be brought in by leading INT talents and assess the potential contribution to Hong Kong's INT development and economy in order to provide them with tailor-made plans to facilitate the setting up of their operations in Hong Kong. The government will set up the Advisory Committee on Attracting Strategic Enterprises, comprising representatives from relevant business sectors and social leaders to advise the FS on the overall strategy. Three. The government has set key performance indicators for measures to trawl for talents, targeting to emit at least 35,000 talents annually with an intended duration of stay of at least 12 months through the talent emission schemes from 2023 to 2025. That is an increase of 40% over the annual average number in 2020 and 2021. Leading talents of different industries or fields are expected to be covered. With regard to INT, the purpose of attracting leading talents around the globe is to attract top-notch INT talents to bring with them their businesses or R&D outcomes to Hong Kong. To facilitate the monitoring of progress and effectiveness in meeting these goals, we have set key performance indicators to attract not less than 100 high-potential or representative INT enterprises to set up or expand their businesses in Hong Kong in the coming five years including at least 20 top-notch INT enterprises, bringing more than 10 billion Hong Kong dollars of investment to Hong Kong and creating thousands of local job opportunities. Thank you, President. Mr. Yim Kong. Thank you, President. My question focuses on leading talents, and they are different from uh, top talents as defined in the policy address. Now, I want to provide special facilitation measures for top-notch 
talents and public money may be involved, and the policies must be relevant. I'd like to ask the administration whether, after some time, review the current policies and for leading talents that cannot achieve the desired effect uh, uh, be removed from the list and then facilitation measures given to them will be uh, withdrawn. Secretary, we have to be very uh, cautious. As mentioned in my reply, leading talents are really outstanding talents of a particular industry and facilitation measures will only be provided to them after very vigorous uh, consideration. Mr. Lian Kwa, thank you. Now, we face a severe shortage of manpower. The policy address said that we should take the initiative to approach leading universities in the world to attract their graduates and talents to Hong Kong. My question to the Secretary is, what publicity measures do you have? Will you consider setting up a dedicated department to invite these graduates from top-notch universities, can they be funded by the government to come to visit Hong Kong and join tours so that they have a better understanding of Hong Kong, be attracted to settle here? Secretary, the talent service unit to be chaired by the CS4A has the duty to come up with a comprehensive plan for attracting talents all over the world to come to settle in Hong Kong and start their business here. We will make good use of our ETOs. The Talent Service Unit will map out the overall strategy. Implementation will be done by our ETOs. To take an example, there are 100 top-notch universities uh, in North America, in Europe, and the UK, and there are nine universities on the mainland included in the list. So we will invite the respective ETOs to approach these universities and promote to graduates this top talent pass scheme. Dr. Priscilla Lung, thank you. Now we uh, will... Um, provide the advantages and uh, facilitation measures to attract the right talents to Hong Kong. We should not just look to the U.S. and Europe and even the mainland. We should also consider talents from the Belt and Road initiatives. Now, talents uh, would go for the most uh, favorable place to settle, and I think the measures just outlined by the Secretary are not good enough. Now. In Shamjan, in 2011, they have got a peacock scheme for 10 years. And Yan Tian, Shenzhen, has got a Wutong talents scheme. Talents are divided into four categories. Let me name the first three. Cat A, for those three to six million will be given to um, uh, talents from Shamjan and the mainland, and two to three million uh, to um, Overseas, and then 1.6 million to uh, the talents from Shamjan. Now, you mentioned a number of measures. I'm afraid they are not attractive enough. Will you consider uh, these are very successful schemes for trolling for top notch talents to Hong Kong? Thank you. In mapping out our measures to troll for talents, we have uh, consider different measures adopted by other places, including mainland cities. Now, in our own package, now in terms of our immigration scheme, we have both existing schemes and new schemes. We have relaxed the current requirements, and we've also got a um, one-stop talent service unit. We have thought about this, but we don't think that um, the subsidized scheme implemented in Shamjan may not be appropriate for us. Now, uh, local talents uh, should form the mainstay of our talent pool to be supplemented by talents from overseas. Now, Hong Kong is a place 
with plenty of opportunities. And I think our competitive edge lies in our opportunities. So we should extend our various admission schemes, and then we should provide these facilitating measures, and I think that will be attractive enough. Ms. Maggie Chen, President, the administration would like to introduce leading talents to Hong Kong so that we can have a high potential enterprises in INT to come to Hong Kong. In addition to these uh, measures, now we have got uh, this 30 billion co investment fund. How are we going to use this fund to enhance our development potential so that we can attract leading talents to come to Hong Kong and local talents will also enjoy more opportunities for development? President, as mentioned in the policy addressed by the CE, the co investment fund will consider a co investment to attract enterprises so that there can be co investment. Now, locally, we have plenty of other funds for local enterprises, so there are plenty of um, openings. So the co investment fund uh, will uh, be. Um, launched and implemented by the Office for Attracting Strategic Enterprises, OACs. Thank you. Mr. Edmund Wong, thank you. The administration mentioned a number of schemes to attract talents to Hong Kong. I once put a question to the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau. Now, we have uh, various of uh, top talents of, on um, compliance and accountancy and asset management, and they are uh, the uh, practitioners, I mean accountants. But then in the schemes, uh, we have not covered accountants this time. So I'd like to ask uh, whether our talent list will cover accountancy and legal professionals. Secretary, the talent list include 13 professions. As mentioned in the CE's policy address, we're going to review the talent list very soon. Uh, we will start the review very soon, and uh, if necessary, we will enrich the scope of the talent list. Ms. Nexi Lam, thank you. When it comes to arts and culture talents, I have some ideas to see how we can promote the development of uh, the sector, the culture and tourism administration of uh, the country has got plans to nurture talents in uh, arts and culture for um, preserving the fine tradition of our culture. So while we attract talents into Hong Kong, well, we have an, something like an emperor's apprenticeship scheme so that we can nurture our own students, so that we can have our own uh, talents in the arts and cultural sector. Thank you. Members may note that in the policy address, apart from measures to attract overseas talents, we have also got a lot of ideas for nurturing our own talents in terms of education. Now, we are doing it in a primary, secondary, and post-secondary education sectors. And we spend no efforts in training our local talents for arts. We will enrich our local talent pool so that uh, we will even uh, do better. Mr. Chen Kim Po, now uh, we have uh, Policies are for independence. I think they set restrictions. Uh, they are hindrances for talents to come to Hong Kong. For instance, we have an uh, age limit for children and also a uh, uh, dependent policy for parents, etc. So will the government reconsider these restrictions so that uh, they will not be obstacles for top-notch talents to come to Hong Kong? Now, under our various admission schemes, applicants may at the same time or at the later stage apply to bring their spouses and also dependent children under 18 to come to Hong Kong as well. This is an established and proven scheme. So uh, for the top talent pass scheme, the same will uh, apply. 
for their parents. Uh, once uh, the applicant has become a permanent resident of Hong Kong, they can apply their parents who are over 60 to come to Hong Kong as dependents. Dr. Jimmy Johnny Ng, thank you, President. I welcome the top talent admission, top talent pass scheme so that we can have uh, these people to come to Hong Kong quickly. But what about uh, Web 3.0? We need leading figures, and many of uh, the entrepreneurs are not graduates are from the world's top 100 universities, and they may not have an annual salary of over $2.5 million as a start. So how are we going to attract this group of talents? Secretary, now when we talk about talents of uh, very uh, special skills, now if uh, the annual salary has reached 2.5 million Hong Kong dollars, of course they can come under the top talent pass scheme, but if they have not reached that threshold. Now we've also got the uh, general employment policy and admission scheme for all sorts of talents. We have a talent list. So long as their uh, trades or industries are uh, under the talent list, then they can come to Hong Kong even though they have not yet found an employer. So long as respective industries can prove uh, that they have a shortage of manpower, then they can apply for people to come under these schemes. Mr. Dennis Long, yes, we support uh, various schemes, but as said by Mr. Johnny Ng, uh, many uh, top-notch talents come as a team, and then we need INT people in uh, this um, data economy. Now, for those with an annual salary reaching 2.5 million and also graduation from uh, the world's top 100 universities. Now, we I don't see any universities uh, from GBA in the list. In fact, we should attract talents from GBA uh, for R&D industries. So uh, what other measures do we have? Well, we have the top talent pass scheme, and then we have a talent list uh, for the general employment policy and various uh, talent admission schemes. Now, in the talent list, many industries are in line with the INT industry. So um, if uh, these um, requirements are met, then there is no need for employers to prove that they are um, they are in this uh, sector. In fact, uh, there are nine mainland universities among the top world's top 100 university, and Chongsan University is a um, one of them. Ms. Lawai Kwa, well, as said, uh, we have the talent service unit providing one-stop service. I think uh, the most important supporting measure these talents need is uh, accommodation or housing. So uh, will uh, we help uh, these industry to set up talents, uh, um, accommodation schemes, otherwise uh, many uh, well, top-notch talents will not be interested to come to Hong Kong. Under secretary, yes, we understand that um, accommodation is an important thing. Uh, we are building uh, facilities like InnoCell and in the uh, Hong Kong Shenzhen um, INT Park at uh, River Loop. We will have uh, flexibility in planning so that more INT related talents and employees uh, will have a better uh, living space there. Chen. Last question, seeking an oral reply. Mr. Gary Chen. Thank you, President. It has been reported that due to a rise in fuel costs, the electricity tariffs of the two power companies have increased significantly this year and have shown no sign of coming down so far. On alleviating the burden of electricity tariffs on members of the public as well as the SMEs, will the government inform this council? One, it has been, has been reported that Russian crude oil has been sold at concessionary prices of a 25% discount in recent months. Whether it knows if the two power companies have considered purchasing energy from Russia to reduce the rate of increase in electricity tariffs. 
Two, given that the rise in fuel prices involves international factors and is beyond the control of the two power companies, whether the governments will, by drawing reference from the practices of other governments, roll out mitigation measures or extend the implement implementation period of the electricity charges relief scheme so as to alleviate the burden of electricity tariffs on members of the public and SMEs. And three, in respect of aspects such as enhancing building energy efficiency and encouraging members of the public to reduce electricity consumption of the government's plans to enable smart electricity consumption to be further put into practice in Hong Kong by promoting the application of smart technologies so as to assist members of the public and SMEs in reducing expenditure on electricity tariffs. Thank you, President. Secretary for Environment and Ecology. President, all along the government's policy is to ensure that electricity needs of the community are met safely, reliably and efficiently at reasonable prices and to minimize the environmental impacts of electricity generation. To put this into action, the government regulates the electricity markets of Hong Kong through entering into the scheme of control agreements or the SCAS with the two power companies. According to the SCAs, the government monitors the power companies and the electricity related financial affairs through development plans submitted by the power companies as well as the annual tariff review and auditing review jointly conducted with them. The Environment and Ecology Bureau is now conducting the 2023 tariff review with the two power companies in accordance with the SCAs. Tariff pro proposals made by the two power companies will be examined stringently with reference to the trends in the, in the international fuel market. It is expected that the results of the review will be available by the end of this year. In the past two years, international energy prices keep surging with the individual market prices of crude oil, natural gas and coal registered in, in an increase of 100% to 200% and 500% respectively. Amid the energy crisis aggravated by the conflicts between Russia and Ukraine since earlier this year, the international fuel prices accelerated rapidly. This has taken a heavy toll on electricity tariffs worldwide, with um, Singapore, Tokyo and London range, um, uh, with a tariff, tariff increase um, range from over 20% up to even 70%, and Hong Kong is no exception. The situation in Hong Kong is relatively better. However, following the increases in monthly fuel cost adjustments, Hong Kong's overall net tariffs in November also saw an increase of nearly 20% over January this year. Regarding electricity tariff for residential customers in general, the current tariffs per units of electricity of CLP and Hong Kong Electric are 1.42 and 1.52 respectively, whereas the respective residential tariffs in Singapore... Sydney, Tokyo, and uh, London and Berlin were um, 1.74, 2.03, $3, $3, $3.66 per unit of electricity in last month. Therefore, our tariff is still competitive. Hong Kong has enjoyed a stable electricity supply with relatively moderate increases in tariffs, thanks to our regulatory regime. The SEAs capitalize on the advantages of two models, namely government monitoring and commercial operation. The government will critically examine crit capital expenditures of the two power companies to avoid excessive or unnecessary investments thereby stabilizing tariff rates and providing sufficient incentives for ensuring a stable power supply. Meanwhile, cuts throat compet competitions are eradicated and power supply will not be disrupted by closure of power companies. In times of energy crisis, the power companies can make timely and flexible deployments under their commercial operations models to stabilize the supply of electricity, causing less impact on tariff rates. Moreover, fuel cost is charged to customers on actual basis, such that the power companies cannot make any profits therefrom. My reply to the question raised by Mr. Gary Chen is as follows. One, in order to ensure stable power supply in the territory, the government has kept abreast of market developments and maintained liaison with the two power companies. Of the two power companies' existing fuel mix for electricity generation, nuclear power from Dia Bay accounts for about 30%, while the remaining is mainly natural gas imported from the pipelines in mainland, and coal accounts for about a quarter. The natural gas purchased by the two power companies is sourced from multiple channels so as to control the and diversify the risk. In order to obtain the lowest price, the majority of them are long-term contracts with take-or-pay clauses as well. Therefore, purchasing natural gas from other suppliers will only add burden to the fuel cost. As for coal-fired coal generation, the two power companies make advanced purchases from suppliers as far as possible to ensure stability in price and supply. Besides, fuel oil is mainly used as fuel for the operation of backup generating units, which has little to do with the tariff. Hence, both power companies have said they have not purchased any crude oil from Russia. The two power companies are jointly constructing an offshore LNG terminal in Hong Kong waters. Upon completion, the two power companies will be able to purchase LNG from the international markets directly, thereby enhancing their bargaining power and reducing the tariff pressure. As coal price has risen sharply in recent years, the power companies are gradually using cleaner energy for electricity generation. The demand for coal-fired energy will continue to decline. 
to the government will continue to provide a monthly relief of $50 for each eligible residential electricity account since 2019 until the end of year 2023. A new round of electricity charges subsidy of $1,000 in total for residential accounts was also launched in June this year until May next year. In addition, the two power companies have provided support measures under their respective community energy saving funds to assist customers from SME and disadvantaged groups. We have to point out that international energy prices are affected by an array of factors and the future outlook is still considerably uncertain. Provision of subsidy by the government is not a long-term sustainable option and they will end up with a heavy burden on public finance. The best way to tackle this is to save energy. The prevailing technology allows ample room for electricity saving. All sectors of our community can also join hands to save energy by making changes in electricity consumption patterns and lifestyle choices. These result in energy consumption at a global level as well as electricity expenses being reduced altogether, hence offsetting the impact of fuel cost increases. Three, as to the application of smart technologies, enhancing the transparency of data and benchmarks helps mobilize the community to achieve smart electricity consumption and take collective actions to conserve energy. The EMSD has launched the online building-based electricity utilization index benchmarking tool, which allows users to unveil energy saving opportunities through comparing and reviewing the annual overall electricity utilization performance of commercial buildings. The tool also provides energy saving advice for buildings. Also, through the Carbon Neutrality Partnership, the government encourages public and private sectors to set energy saving and carbon reduction targets and share their measures and results with the public. Through the ENM Inno Portal, the government matches innovative and technological solutions developed by enterprises and academic institutions which service needs with service needs from the government, public organizations, as well as the electrical and mechanical trades, and to conduct pilot projects in a collaborative manner. More than 160 projects are being tested with 40 being energy saving and renewable energy related projects, including management of ventilation and air conditioning system with AI algorithms. In order to facilitate and promote smart electricity consumption, the two power companies are installing smart meters for the customers in phases and expects completion by 2025. At present, nearly 2 million customers have been using smart meters, which help them monitor and manage electricity consumption more effectively, thereby encouraging energy saving. Lastly, the government has put in place the Energy Saving for All websites to help the community reduce energy consumption, ease the burden of electricity expenses, and, a- and enable the realization of smart electricity consumption in Hong Kong. Thank you, President. Mr. Gary Chen. President, you are a veteran of the business sector. There are no businesses model, uh, which is a sure win. What business model can fully transfer the additional cost to the consumers? The answer is the two power companies. In my main question, I mentioned that the major rise in electricity tariffs are due to the rise in fuel cost. Now, the power companies are fully transferring the additional cost to the consumers, and they are not taking the share at all. Why do the members of the public have to bear the full fuel cost? Why can't the government and the power companies share the burden? In terms of the monitoring of the uh, fuel cost recovery account, is the supervision too lax? Secretary. First, on the adjustment um, in fuel cost, we have a very robust regulatory regime. The two power companies have to review the changes in international fuel costs in the past for the past few months, every three months, and uh, make an adjustment. If there is a reduction of fuel costs, and um, there will be an immediate, um, it will be immediately reflected in the um, electricity tariff. Now, a few years ago, um, in one year, um, the fuel costs. Um, has dropped by 40%. At the same time, for the same year, um, there is um, there was also a 40% uh, reduction in electricity uh, tariff. So the mechanism is effective. Mr. Gary Chen raised a, an important question. That is, um, what is our approach in monitoring the electricity market? As mentioned in my main reply, the government has adopted a regulatory regime through the Scheme of Control Agreements, or the SCAs. 
this is a combination of um, a government's uh, regulation regulated approach with um, the uh, uh, private with private decisions. So this is um, a very effective um, mechan mechanism. We compare um, the electricity tariff um, locally and beyond um, Hong Kong. So compared with um, the hike in electricity tariffs um, of other jurisdictions, uh, Hong Kong is doing relatively well. Now for other places, um, the adjustment um, is, would be affected by investment and cost. In Hong Kong, the government monitor the investment decisions are made by the power companies to make sure that um, there is no excessive investment. The power companies can only make profits uh, from capital investments in Hong Kong. In other places, there would be a competition model. So with that model in mind, um, the companies may transfer all the additional fuel costs to Hong Kong. And they ended up with a higher electricity tariff because um, the total capital investments they make is larger than uh, the two companies uh, in Hong Kong. F say, for example, um, generators and so on. So with higher investments costs, the, there will be higher electricity tariff. So we do have um, an institutional advantage um, to ensure um, the lowest electricity tariff possible. Mr. Ari Lee, President, I paid close attention to the main reply of um, the Secretary. Secretary, do you think that the current practice is very reasonable? I mean that um, according to your main reply, the adjustments in fuel costs would be dealt with um, under um, a reimbursement principle. And um, the two companies that cannot transfer the burden to the uh, customers. Well, do you think transferring the additional fuel cost um, to the customers is a reasonable approach? Now, the two power companies are allowed um, an, an eight percent profit. So beyond that, they are not; they do not have to bear the risk in terms of a uh, fuel cost adjustments at all. So, do you think that is reasonable, Secretary? Well, I have to clarify that I am not defending the two power companies. I'm just giving an explanation on our regulatory regime. We are doing our best to keep the electricity tariff in Hong Kong as a minimum by stringently monitoring the operation and investments, capital investment decisions made by the power companies. This is an effective regime in keeping the tariffs um, at a uh, low level. Compared with other other places, our electricity tariffs are relatively low. So that is the fact. On your question, whether the government has done our best to lower the electricity tariffs, or in terms of a cost control, the government would require the power companies to provide evidence that all the investments, all the capital invested, are for meeting the electricity needs in Hong Kong. So that has been proven effective in terms of controlling the electricity and tariffs. In terms of uh, using the reimbursement model, we can ensure that uh, no profits can be earned by the power companies um, on the investment. So there are two benefits. First of all, uh, we can ensure st stability in um, electricity and generation in Hong Kong. In the past two years, because of the energy crisis, um, there has been um, a surge in fuel costs. Over the world, many power companies have closed down because of the crisis. In Singapore, um, there have been several uh, power companies um, which um, closed down because of the crisis. In Europe and other places, um, there, are, there have been instabilities in terms of energy, electricity generation. That is, um, that is because um, the government uh, did not ensure that um, the electricity generation can remain stable amidst a uh, fuel cost crisis. In Hong Kong, in terms of um, financing, um, 
the investors, including power companies, uh, enjoy an edge. As a result, um, the costs um, can be lowered, so it, so they um, enjoy a competitive edge um, from our institution. Mr. Dennis Leung. Thank you, President. Electricity is um, a daily necessity, and it is also a public utility. In Hong Kong, however, we have um, an um, oligarch, oligarch, uh, oligarchy um, supply model in Hong Kong. Even with um, additional um, supply, um, it is not enough. Now, in the main reply, uh, you mentioned um, other uh, places like Singapore, Tokyo, London, uh, Berlin, and so on. In Hong Kong, uh, for CLP, um, the price is $1.42 per unit. Uh, for Hong Kong Electric, it is $1.52 per unit. Now, the government think, thinks um, this is a very good job. However, I've just looked at um, the data um, across the trade and um, in mainland. In year 2022, in March, Hong Kong's um, electricity per unit was um, cost of $1.25. In Macau, it was $1.19 per unit. In Taiwan, uh, China, it was $0.69 per unit. In the mainland, it is just $0.59 per unit. Hong Kong has a free economy. However, the government is protecting the public utility uh, companies and ensuring them a uh, return. According to President Xi's uh, speech, well, I w my question to the government is, how can the government lower the burden borne by the public? Um, can the government can the government lower the allowable uh, profits for the two companies? President, I have um, clearly explained how the government is controlling the electricity tariffs in Hong Kong. That is by combining and. Um, government uh, monitoring and um, market operation. We are controlling the investment input as well as uh, keeping operating costs at a low so as to lower the uh, electricity tariff. So the um, places I mentioned are comparable markets. So compared with other um, free markets, Hong Kong is enjoying um, an edge on whether we can lower the permitted rates of return for the two power companies. Well, we do have the SCAs uh, in place, uh, which will be valid until 2033. Based on um, the contractual spirit, we don't think it is the right time to adjust the permitted rates of return. Well, um, approaching year 2033, maybe um, we can review the arrangement. Mr. Michael, look. The Secretary's attitude is uh, complacent. He says that, um, our tariffs are already very low, and he has done a lot. Well, um, Mr. Dennis Leung um, busted um, this myth. The two power companies are monopolizing the markets. They are protected by the government's policies. Every time they would uh, they would make the most out of um, the permitted rate of return. They wouldn't budge at all. I have been criticizing them for a long time. President, on the other hand, I understand the government will not lower the permitted rate of return um, no matter what we say. So what can the government um, do in terms of diversifying um, the energy um, generation models? For example, the LNG um, offshore station now, the, uh, we have a very stable uh, natural uh, gas um, supplier, that is uh, the Yai Cheng um, natural gas. We have to rely on the country. Now, in uh, Hainan, um, there, is a, there is a new um, natural gas uh, field um, developed. Now, can the government reach out to um, the uh, mainland government to ensure that uh, there can be stable and um, stable supply of natural gas at a reasonable price? Secretary, President, uh, in my main reply, I mentioned that the two power companies are building an offshore LNG um, processing at depot for procurement of natural gas from international suppliers. So in the future, there will be more options. 
So any suppliers who are able to offer us uh, with an um, price uh, price uh, with um, a competitive price uh, will be considered. And also, uh, Mr. Lok mentioned, uh, are we going to consider more energy supply supply and model to lower the tariffs? My answer is yes. Well, under the um, decarbonization goal um, by year 2050, um, we will explore renewable energy um, and zero carbon energy uh, suppliers um, in the world and in the mainland. If there are um, choices, uh, we will definitely choose them. Government bills. First reading. Supplementary